Our next talk is from Wandi at the Idaho National Laboratories. And no, not there anymore. No. Failed. Yeah, failed. Oh, yeah, I'm awesome. Thank you. So, our next talk is Wandi from Aha. Uh, <laughs> well, Juan and I were in grad school together and he left for I know. Uh, I apologize. Anyways, from Aha, and we'll be presenting a DVDS 2X receiver. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, before I get started, I just want to take a little a, a short survey, and that is uh, if you just raise your hands, uh, how many here are, let's see, new radio hobbyists? You keep your hands up, I just want you to like see your hands. It's about 30, 40 of you guys. And then how many are academic? Academic only. Seems like 10 maybe. And how many are other? Other? Okay. So uh, okay, that's, that's good. And how many here uh, get tired after lunch? What? Keep your hands up. Okay, here. Can we Phil? Keep your hands up, please, Phil. What? Okay. What? I don't know what I do. Oh. It's going up. It's going up. It's going up. Oh. 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 Okay, hold on, let me wind up. Oh! oh. oh. <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> Alright, so, anyways, uh, AJ Ford, Moscow, Moscow, Idaho, so I just bought a little memento. Uh, this is the uh, Idaho Spud, it's the, uh, the candy, if you will, from Idaho. If you're not familiar with Idaho, we're famous for potatoes. <laughs> you didn't know that already, but not these ones, the real ones. They get put in a lot of McDonald's fries. But, anyways, um, we're for, we call ourselves AHA, but some people refer us to AHA, but at the end of this presentation, I hope you guys will have your AHA moment. Uh, before I introduce, uh, go and introduce myself a little bit more on AHA, uh, I do have one small bit of bad news, and that is um, we didn't really use the new radio in our projects, so I want to apologize for that. But I think that a lot, I've got something in my presentation a little bit for everyone. People who aren't really familiar with a lot of the meta stuff, I think you'll really enjoy those parts, parts to it. We do have a new tie-in, a new radio tie-in in the end, uh, specifically with RF Knox. So that's where we are looking for people to talk to us and give us input on how we can try to integrate what we have into the like, new radio ecosystem. So, uh, so before I get into that that type of discussion, let me tell you a little bit about uh, AHA. Uh, we have our background. We've had 25. Over 25 years of experience in doing Ford air correction codes, one of the first things we did that really put us on the map was we developed the first uh, Reed Solomon integrated circuit for NASA when they were doing space communications. And since then, we've done a lot of things. And for all you academics out there who could understand this, but anything with a Galois field in it, that's pretty much what we worked on. So, <laughs> source, champ coding, so data compression, Ford air correction, and encryption, those are pretty much our, our major product lines. Uh, most of our stuff goes into um, contact EF data modems. If you are contact EF data, they're one of the largest VSAT modem providers in the world. And uh, we make a lot of the core technologies that go with all the modems. And as a matter of fact, when uh, back before my time at AHA, when they were going out of business, contact realized that you know if this company goes out of business, we're losing a lot of our core technology, so they ended up buying us up. And we also have our separate business lines other than just our um, the work we do for content via data. Um, this is just some of our, some of our core fact products that we make, and when I say core, I mean, you know, uh, software on it, or or you know, zip files, those types of things that I'm talking about. So we do a lot of low density party check codes. We have a GPS 2X core. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And also, Reed Solomon and Turbo Product cards are just other types of um, uh, core error correction that's used inside the satellite industry. So to introduce myself a bit more, I'm a, a Virginia Tech grad. I got my PhD there in 2012. Went to school with a lot of the people from Edis. So it's really nice to come back into this community and also just to start getting integrated and knowing a lot, a lot of new people in that video radio community. You guys have a lot of really good energy, and it's been really uh, a big pleasure to, to be here just uh, since uh, since Monday. One of the reasons we put together this presentation is we really wanted to share our experience 
for doing design on X310. So can I use by a show of hands? Like how many people use X, X310 or the X300 family? So it's like maybe, less, maybe a quarter, maybe less than a quarter. Okay. So some of the reasons, uh, another thing we wanted to do also is just try to invite some more discussion on uh, making cores for our attack. We'll talk about that at the end. So the motivation for you paying attention is that DBS 2X is going to do things to help increase DOD's capacity. One of the biggest problems right now in the DOD is they don't have enough bandwidth to get data off platforms in real time. So this is one of the things that's going to help them do that. And another thing also towards the end is, you know, if, you want, if you're using an X310 and you want to improve the performance of your new radio system, or if you have um, your new radio with, I think the E310 is probably uh, another family that we can work with also. If you want to perform, improve the performance of those systems, then you probably want to pay attention for that reason also. So before I get into to the, the conversation that we're really interested in, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our product that we did, uh, which is the modem design section. Before that, we're just going to have a short overview over DVDS 2X so you can understand uh, what exactly we did and, and why we did it. Okay, so this is the overview. All right. So we had a customer come to us, and they were in urgent need of getting a, a, a basically a data, a data modem up and working. We said, well, we've got the FET core for that. And they said, well, we really need a lot more work done. So can, can you give us other pieces? And we, because we were part of Compact Keep Data, we were able to scrap something together really quick. And to do that, we went and got an X310 and did that. But this is the uh, what we provided, basically. So give you guys the 2X is a digital video broadcast standard extension to S2. And what it offers is um, just basically the physical link layer. So they have different, a bunch of different options, but some of the, the biggest things that changed in S2, you actually could change the roll-off factors for your Nyquist filter, and they did roll-off factors from 0.2 to 0.3. And S2X added an additional additional options for roll-off factors from 0.5, you know, all the way down to 0.5. So by doing that, we're trying to increase the spectral efficiency there. And what I did is I took our our uh, spectrum monitor and plotted the different uh, roll-off factors from our, from our modem there, so you can see. For modulation and coding, I don't think there's a standard that supports a wider array of modulation and coding combinations than, than UBS 2X. I mean, they go all the way from DPSK to 256 APSK, and they also have a significant operating range, which I'll talk about next. Um, their coding also, they have really, really tight codes. They have an inner LDPC code, which is a low-density parity check code, and a, a BCH Code. I don't remember, that's the names of three guys if you're not familiar with that, but you, sometimes you're lucky if you can just pronounce all those correctly. And then the rates are between uh, one fifth and uh, eight ninths code. So we have a bunch of combinations of codes. And usually when you uh, are talking to people about these, you know, these types of things, you, uh, you give them this graph, this graph which shows the spectral efficiencies. Is, can I give a show of hands? How many people are not familiar with spectral efficiency graphs like this? Or not? Just one person. Want to be honest? Okay, that's, that's enough to explain. Okay, so basically what you do, you got, let's see here. Okay, so a lot of people have seen these waterfall plots like this before where you have, for example, a, uh, you get, can you see my mouse on Yeah, we always see it. Yeah. It's there. Okay, but anyways, over here on the very right, on the top right, you see that it does a typical waterfall plot you see where the, the x-axis is an is an energy over noise, and then on the, the y-axis you see it's a block a bitter array or block array. And as you increase the, the amount of energy over noise you have, you get a lower bitter array or block array, right? And so you want to get further right, you get more and more, you know, more bits come out clear. So what you do for all those different combinations of modulation and coatings, you just Draw a line across what threshold you're going to measure, and in this case, it's kind of the minus fit. This doesn't have anything to do with the stuff I'm just putting up, for example. And then you plot all those points out on that, on that curve, and you get that nice little ramp up curve right there. And uh, the light blue line, the small thin blue line, the line, limits, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that already. But um, what I'm trying to show here is, that, is uh, the improvements between DVBS 2X and DVBS 2 and also show you the operating region of DVBS 2X. So, the biggest advancements over DVBS2 over S2, um, S2 is shown in like the dark blue graph you see there, and then S2X is in the, the light blue. And the bit they DVBS2X added three things to S2, and the first thing is is the lower noise region, uh, the lower SNR region between like minus minus 10 and about minus 3 dB there. 
you see that they added a lot more coding and modulations there to extend that region to that lower, lower SNR region. And then the upper SNR region, uh, the, what I call extended SNR between 15 and 20 dB, they also added uh, much more of their codes. <clears throat> Probably the most significant thing that they added, if you look right in about 8 dB where a lot of people operated, they were able to get about 2.3 dB closer to the Shannon limit by improving the modulation and coding combinations. So they were able to optimize in that area better. And also they added a lot more finer, gran finer granulation. So using adaptive modulation and coding and by looking at your SNR, you can adjust to try to get the most optimal bit error, most, the most optimal and highest throughput for your, your given SNR. So now let's, let's go ahead and talk about the framing next to try to see you know, how it takes in the data and actually wraps it up and shoots it out in terms of link layer. Uh, for our particular project, we use, uh, I guess, a, a front-end framing layer. It's known as a generic stream encapsulation protocol. And what we did is we brought in some, you can just bring in a Ethernet packets, and then what the generic stream encapsulation protocol does is basically just does fragmentation. And fragmentation and framing of Ethernet packets. So once it gets those pa packets and sucks them in, it's able to stick them into the next block, which is called stream, stream adaptation which tells it, you know, which mod cod you're going to use, what type of adaptive modulation and coding, and then shoves it into the, the block size for that, for that particular, they call it mod cod for short, so I'm just going to save that for the rest of the presentation. Um, and then once you get that block, you go ahead and code it. There's some scrambling in there also. They go ahead and code it and add the parity on from both the codes, and then ship it off on, on the physical link. So the, the, the physical layer framer as the, the header, which contains the start frame information and information to how to decode the rest of the frame, and also inserts pilots uh, periodically so that you can maintain synchronization. So let's go ahead and go directly into the modem design for what we did. So like I said, we had a customer come to us and they said, we really got to get this thing on it done, we have a tech schedule, so we didn't really have any hardware, we just didn't have anything to give them at the time, but they really wanted to get going on it, so we knew SDRs were a good way to go. And so what we did is we ended up buying an X310, and I forgot to say this earlier, but when we were starting to work with this and doing our project, I mean, Edis was, was freaking awesome to us, so nothing but thanks to say to them, and uh, Matt has been really supportive of us, um, you know, talking about this project too, so thanks, thanks to Edis. Um, but basically what we're doing is we're bringing in Ethernet packets, you see there on the left, on, on the... Uh, the Ethernet interface there. So we're not doing any uh, interface to the computer, any control of a host there. Those Ethernet packets are going in, going out through the bottom bottom layer there, you see there, out through the, the digital IQ samples, go out through the digital analog converter. They get mixed up to the, to the right frequency we're going to transmit at, and then we have some attenuator there, an attenuator there for controlling gain, and then, you know, out into the air. And then on the receive pack back, you can see the same thing too. Um, Plus, you know, so you know, this, S, the SBX is one of the number boards that you guys don't remember what Matt has, Matt has talked about. And what that has on it is basically just uh, two mixers, some attenuators, and LNAs, and that type of thing. And it interfaces right down to uh, the X310, and that's what we use. And coming back on the RF path on the very top, you'll see, you know, basically come, coming back in the same way, same thing. And then gate comes in and out. Uh, for our host, we actually use RS232 interface on the X310. And some, I don't know, some, some of you might be surprised at what we actually used. Right, what, what computer did you find to do that? Well, we didn't, we didn't have one, so we actually had to make our own cable to do that. And the reason why we used it is because we couldn't use an Ethernet cable because we're trying to pull data out of that. It's actually, you know, it's actually make a motor that's doing, you know, getting data through. There's, you have to use that port for something else, so we already used RS-232. And then we used some of the UHT's code and hijacked their, uh, the serial peripheral interface bus. And what this does, it allows you to go ahead and, and program all the, the devices on the board. So all the <clears throat> so if you're doing automatic game control, a good example is if you want to adjust the attenuation, you use the SPI bus for doing that. And also if you're changing your frequencies, you're going to want to be able to write to those mixers to tell them to move the, your local box and, and so on and so forth. So uh, that that part for me, this is all, you know, I, I'm a pretty big noob in terms of embedded systems, so this is really exciting for me to learn all this. And, knowing how the, you know, the implementation stuff comes together is uh, really, really cool. So we're going to dive in now into the actual core. So you see there, you know, on the very left-hand side, the Ethernet packs are coming out. We've got digital I on the, which on the right. I talked a lot about that whole data flow from the, you know, the, the slides that showed the framing. But one of the things I thought we did that 
that I worked on and I thought was pretty cool is we actually put on an embedded CPU onto the uh, the onto the, the FPGA that Kintex seven there, and uh, what we use a it's called a ZPU, Xilinx CPU, and it's the smallest CPU you can get that supports GCC. And uh, what it actually does will actually spit out from the make file your your RAM file that actually goes into the FPGA, and I, I thought that was really cool. And it actually has a, a wishbone interface that lets you address everything from from C. So so when you make a pointer, you're actually pointing to not some nebulous address like you're doing in a, in a CPU, but actually something physical in your, your FPGA design. So to me, that was, that was really exciting. And then um, the modem also does some, it, in our case, it does some uh, automatic gain control, but also could be programmed and capable of doing uh, any adaptive coding and modulation on there. So, and in, in addition to that, also on our host, we added quite a few things. We have a you know, like a Python command line interface to control the modem as well. So if you wanted to do any kind of, you know, software developed things to, you know, run which frequencies want to go on. If we got some type of spectrum sensing, I thought it might be cool we could, you know, start doing some type of spectrum sharing application with this as well. But uh, that's kind of about it. Um, I just wanted to show you really quick what we did for, you can't really see that very well, but uh, that's pretty much what it looks like to an operator just just want to run like a single test and Try to make sure everything's working functionally. We've got some of the on the bottom there is the console stuff that's going over the SPI bus. So to evaluate the performance of that, we basically just took our modem and hooked it up to hooked it up to a, a carrier noise generator. Now those are really convenient. All this is a computer programmable with the host, and we're able to test all our different modulation and coding schemes and you know show you how good the S X310 actually can do and you know, the potential of it. So and this is what it looks like. And so basically this is the same spectral efficiency curve. And the primary thing I want to show you here is the, the curve in the magenta. And basically what we're showing is that we're really close to the spec. We have very, very low implementation loss in, in an X310. And the reason why I mentioned that, oh, and also we're able to get up to 324 megabits per second for this design, for the 72, 72 mega symbols per second. And at the higher spectral efficiency there, that's, that's our maximum throughput. So the reason why I'm saying that is because just with the existing designs as they are now, and this is another reason why we're so excited to see our not, the only thing the FPGA does on this natively is just give you IQ samples, right? And so you are you have this FPGA that's not even being used, I mean, in a, I'm not, uh, I guess if you're doing spectrum collection, you know, this problem is not gonna work for you, but um, what I'm trying to say is that there's so much capability on this on this platform, it's, it's just, to me, I, I think it just, we just need to really use RF not to try to take advantage of that. So anyways, that's kind of uh, what we did in terms of the modem design that. And um, so in, in summary and conclusion, so basically uh, DBS2X and increases the spectral efficiency over DBS2. And our modem, our modem design and performance, we're able to uh, get a low implementation loss modem on you know just something that you can buy off the shelf. And it, it reaches a really good data rate. Now the discussion, I want to try to go to the discussion a little bit, is uh, what we're considering now too, is because we're, we're an IP core company, so that's what we do. One of the things that Edison, Matt Edison and ourselves have been talking about, so is there an opportunity for FPG, FPG, FPGA cores to actually be developed in the NSDR ecosystem, right? So I'm sure you guys have seen something similar to this, like what Mark showed this morning. But essentially, what what I think we have is probably the best possible option for software developers to be able to take advantage of hardware. So what I've been noticing even across the industry, in the high, and specifically in the high performance computing industry, is a lot of people are hawking these uh, uh, PCIe boards with FPGAs on them. And what they're pushing, trying to get software developers to do is to, is to adopt OpenCL. And I haven't really heard a lot of good, uh, I know Altera and I'm trying to bash the the FPGA companies or anything like that, but from our experience working in FPGAs and seeing that what the you have the user interacts, we think that this model where we're bringing up primitives up to the software level without having the software developer to have to do any coding on the FPGA at all is probably the best model for getting hardware acceleration. So, in terms of that, uh, we want to know from you guys, you know, what types of things do you want to see accelerated? So, for us. From a business model, we obviously want to try to make you know custom cores or hot cores we can license, but also we're considering 
doing you know some free course so people can try out some of our products and figure out what you know what things work for them things they don't want there's just some a list of some things that we we know that needed could use acceleration for example demodulation especially higher order modulations uh, data compression is also something that's extremely CPU intensive. I know uh, Martin has that on his slide. And by the way, we did not collaborate before I, I put this together. So, and also on crypto security is another good example of uh, things that gets, that gets accelerated. And it, specifically in our area, it's you know forward error correction, LDPC codes, turbo codes, and those types of things. So, and custom. And and if you have an application where you have a specific, you need some type of specific core that you know. You know, come talk to us. We'd be really uh, willing to, interested to hear what you have to say. And that's all I have for my presentation. And hope you guys, you know, have some questions or, or comments on, on that. All right. Uh, can I put round of applause for one? Uh, all right. And maybe yes, we already have a question from Sean. Um, all right, uh, so how did uh, how did you guys handle the adaptation to switch between? Well, did you just implement like all these various uh, you know modulation types and uh, coding types and uh, how do you switch between them? Do you do that based on received you know? Oh, okay, ways? so so the standard doesn't tell you how to do that, but what people usually do is they just try to shoe something, shoehorn something into the DB header. They'll tell you that information, and that usually that's some type of uh, integrator's secret sauce of some kind. So uh, we didn't provide that in this project. We were going to leave that to our customer to put in that part for them. So okay, is that where you see something like you know RF knock giving you know, or maybe even that CPU that you embedded making decisions on the fly? Yeah, the yeah, that's totally something that can happen. Yeah, and that that was something we talked about that could be implemented, but in this project we didn't end up doing that. Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Oh, all right, I'm gonna have a round of applause.